And here we are. All right, now this one is going to be a lot of fun. I've known Ori Hoffmeckler, the man I'm talking here to here today for 18 years now. I was just looking at the cassette tape, Ori, of when I interviewed you back in 2002. This is when I first got into the fitness business. And I was a huge fan of your warrior diet information. And actually, I was a huge fan of the warrior diet even before the book came out. Because I remember when Testosterone Magazine or TNation.com did that interview with you. And I found it ridiculously fascinating because it, it was so opposite of what all of us thought was the effective way to eat back then. Because we were just bombarded with, if you want to be strong, fit, lean, muscular, you have to eat six small meals a day, which I always hated doing. You know, I did it because I thought that's what we needed to do, but I always hated doing it because when you eat six small meals a day, a couple things happen. One, you're never satisfied ever, ever. You're never satisfied. You're eating a little bit and then going, waiting until the next one. And then two, your whole day revolves around when your next meal is coming. You're always thinking about, uh oh, a couple hours now I got to eat. Let me make sure I have food on hand at all times so I have something to eat. And if you miss one of those small meals, your blood sugar levels crash. I mean, you're basically creating insulin resistance eating so often. I don't care if it's healthy, you're just eating so often. So when I came across your information, it reminded me of what I learned when I studied the Nation of Islam in college. Because the Nation of Islam, as you may know, people like Malcolm X, they only eat one time a day. They do a lot of things. Really? I didn't know. I thought only during the Ramadan they do. No, no, no. What, traditional Muslims, yes. But Nation of Islam is a subset of Islam. It's not recognized as legitimate Islam by traditional Muslims. It's basically somewhat of a cult. It's their own thing. So they, they took elements of Islam and then combined it with more of a black nationalism type approach. But oh, one of the things that's really interesting. Yeah, they're really into discipline. So they only eat one time a day. It's a water fast. And often they're, they're not their founder, but their head guy, Elijah Muhammad, he often recommended eating every other day or every third day. And, and if you look at these, if you look at all the members, none of them are overweight. None of them. They look young, healthy, dignified. They look incredible, all the members. And part of it is because their diet. So your book, so when I read that interview with you, it reminded me of... Malcolm X talking about fasting and reminded me of what these men and women do. So it wasn't the first time I ever came across something like that, but it was the first time I ever thought, wow, this can actually work for someone who wants to adopt a fitness lifestyle. Because when I read about the Nation of Islam, I go, okay, hey, that's great, but I'm into lifting heavy weights. I'm active. I'm not, I can't just eat once a day. You know, that's not going to be enough fuel. But yours actually made a lot more sense. So let me just turn it over to you. When, when did this whole thing start for you, this – this whole, not even intermittent fasting, but under eating, going through phases of under eating and over eating. And one final thing, you don't get enough credit, but all of this intermittent fasting information that we see out there, none of it would be out there if it wasn't for your influence. You know, you're definitely the one who spearheaded that whole thing, especially in the fitness community. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate what you say. And in many ways, you're right, because when I wrote The Warrior Diet, in fact, when I started it, it was blasphemy basically for any dietitian i was bad the book was almost banned wow. um including by people who my publisher they had never heard about a person that advocate reducing the amount of meal per day right. and when you talk about the nation of islam in my book i had a chapter one of the things that inspired me early on is the wild Arab, these nomads, they're called Bedayin. They yeah. live in yeah. North Africa too. Uh, they live in uh, Saudi Arabia. They live, of course, in the Middle East, uh, in Israel. They look like rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Muhammad, during the seventh century, was somehow related to this nomad Arab, wild Arab Bedaeen, right. who were living one meal uh, on a one meal per day. When you look at the desert, I was about several months in the Judea desert, which can rise up to 130 degrees and yeah. more during the day. 
it's yeah. impossible to think about eating yeah. during January. So most of the eating of in during the desert are done at night. Right. And I said before, I'm not Christian, but even Jesus has his last supper, not his last breakfast. It yeah. just did not exist. What exists in the Bible, it's called Pachat Harit. That means something very small, a piece of nothing, frugal bread or something that you eat in the morning. When King David bring food to his brother, who was soldier under King Saul, about to fight the Philistine, just before he was facing Goliath. He was sent by Ishai, his father, to bring food to his brothers. He doesn't bother running early in the morning. Right. No, coming toward the evening for supper. We are not biologically designed to eat throughout the day, definitely to eat so many meals. Right. We can eat stuff during the day, but generally very light, very frugal, and we are not talking about just the Bible time. We are talking about groups of warriors who had to stay in shape because that was their lifestyle. We are talking about the Spartans. We are talking about the early Greeks, not the later one. We are talking about the Roman soldiers. Yeah. For them, it was a religion. In fact, according to Plato, Socrates, right? It is, and later on the Roman, it is the warrior, it is the noble people. It is those who live on the sword. They're supposed to live like this. The slaves were fed like cattle. Yeah. Like farm animals. Right. Not stop because it makes you submissive. Yes. I don't know when was the last time you ate non-stop, but it does something to the brain, make you numb. It you does. Sure. Yeah. You're not ready. In my latest book, which is called The Seven Principles of Stress, um, I clearly show biological mechanisms of stress, which are so critical for our survival. We've got to challenge our body. You do it, and you do it well when you exercise. Your body responds by becoming stronger, not necessarily always bigger, stronger, more agile, more durable. But we can also do it nutritionally. So early on, when I was in the army, I realized that when I eat, like other people, you got five, 10 minutes to finish this and finish this and finish this. It numbed me. It right. slowed me down. Right. In fact, it, it slowed me down, not just mentally, it create problem when you need to run with food on your stomach. It's not good. No, not at all. <laughs> and many uh, armies during wartime warn the soldier to not eat prior to battle for many reasons. For many reasons. Alexander the Great, one of the key secrets for his victory, he admit, was to attack the Persian when they were eating during the day. Right. They right. were spoiled the Persians. They were had armies of chefs and this and that. I'm sure the food was great, but my God, wrong time. Right. So um Sun, Sun Tzu has a similar story of, of when you attack an enemy, especially one that has higher numbers, wait until they're feasting and relaxed. Yes. And let, them, let, them get, let them get comfortable with their victory. So they're just celebrating for a week. And now they've been celebrating for a week, just eating, just relaxing. Boom. Now you attack them. And they, they have no way to defend. They're, they're not mentally prepared or even physically prepared for any confrontation. It's very true. Food does something to you. And um, I, think, I think food has to be earned. And I think that's the big problem that, especially here in the US, where we have a ridiculously increasing obesity epidemic. And I think that the pandemic we're in is more 
a result of our obesity epidemic than it is contact with the virus. But that's a separate that that's a separate point that I've made a million times. But just look at how look at how much people eat in America. They're always eating. If you're not eating a meal, you're snacking. And then you're sitting around eating. Think about every socializing event. What do people do? Let's get together for lunch. Let's get together for dinner. Let's get together for food. Now, when I get together with someone, I want to go do something active. I go, let's go hiking at Red Rock. Let's go skateboarding in the neighborhood. Let's go get a workout in the gym. That's how I like to interact with people. And I like eating, of course, and relaxing like everybody else. But I really feel that when you wake up in the morning and you haven't done anything yet, you don't really deserve anything yet. <laughs> go earn it. No, That's do something. That's to look at it. I look at it very simple. You always deserve to put something that you want to put in your body, but just put the right stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with good roasted coffee in the morning. It really yeah. acts in your no, brain. You're a guy. <laughs> you amazing stuff. You want to meet over something. Sit, meet over coffee. You want to have a few fruits. Okay, I really explain a list of stuff that you can have during the day. Don't feel guilty. Just train your body to lead the way it's programmed to lead. Right. So you never feel guilty. And you know what, Mike? It happened to you. It happened to me many years ago. It happened to many of the Warrior Diet followers. After a few weeks of following this routine, you don't want to go back. You don't want to go back. In fact, you can't. Right. I, have, I saw it so many times. It's like people, I wrote about it before, who never had sex and suddenly they did. They don't <laughs> want to stop it. If they yeah, enjoy everything, it, everything, the changes. Changes. everything changes. The way you the way you walk changes, the way you talk changes, the way you yeah. carry yourself changes. You got this little twinkle in your eye that you didn't have before, it all changes. But you nail something. There's almost a conspiracy of this industry to make our society dependent on the food product. Right. Starting with the cereals of the morning. Going yeah. on to all these women, Betty Crocker and all these names of funny <laughs> cartoon like Aunt Jemima. I think yeah. Aunt Jemima and Quaker Oat killed more people than all the wars, quite honestly. And today, during the COVID, you can see how dangerous it is to overlook your physical condition. You right. can't allow yourself to be obese or diabetic or suffer from metabolic syndrome. And this way of eating, the normal American way, not just in America, it's all over the world right now, right. including in China, they adopted yeah. this horrible way. So it's almost a conspiracy of the industry to make you dependent on this product and they look very inviting. People right. have fun when they go to the supermarket and they see all these sweet things with beautiful design. It does something because we have something primitive here that yeah. both during time of famine, <clears throat> deprivation, lack of food. So like animals, we cherish food and accessibility to food. <clears throat> Animals too. But what happened today is that we're intelligent enough to understand that we have access today. We are not lacking food. So we suppose to still understand our nature and not allow ourselves, not allow the primitive instinct, the bad instinct to overwork and kill us. Right. In the past, maybe starvation killed us, humanity. Now it's excess. And it's not me. It's a fact. Well, you know, what's interesting is that it's, it's actually still starvation. And what I mean by that is, is that what most people eat has no nutritional value whatsoever, that you're getting this sensation of eating. You're getting this oral entertainment, as I like to call it, and not the fun kind. And so now you're getting... So now you're so now you're taking in calories, but it's all empty. It's not nourishing you in any way. And that's the other insidious thing about processed foods is that they actually 
stimulate hunger as opposed to satisfy it. So you eat a big bowl of the cereal you're talking about. Now you want another bowl of it or you want something else. Now you're craving that's it's almost a gateway drug. Now you want now you want waffles. Now you want pancakes with syrup. Now you want cake. So it's it's actually you would actually be better off if you didn't eat anything than eat that. This is very true. But if you call this starvation, I call it basically malnourishment. That means never in history during famine, people died from obesity. Right. During the right. talk of famine, people were very skinny. They basically wasted their bodies. It was a serious danger. And yeah. that's an area in the world. Today, people can die from malnourishment while they're becoming fat, yeah. obese, and diabetics. Right. So um, the key to understand is this. When you are empty, Mike, like you start in the morning, then you train on empty or you do your training, which is a way of depleting energy, basically breaking tissues, challenging your body, exercise by all means is a destructive thing. It's right. against everything that you train to believe. It's good for you. You're supposed to eat to nourish. You're supposed to heal. You're supposed to build. And here you are exercising almost every day, destroying muscle tissues, absolutely challenging, depleting glycogen, burning fat, depleting your body. And yet it's beneficial to you. Right. Once people understand this paradox, they will understand that when your energy depleted, you can tolerate almost anything, including junk food. I don't recommend junk food. But Mike, a person like you, after your massive training, you eat a waffle or you eat something bad, let's say a cake, or it will dissolve no problem. Oh, I agree. I mean, I eat, I, I eat whatever I want, honestly. I eat coconut ice cream every night. I have, I'm on a vegan diet, of course, but I eat vegan desserts. And honestly, I, I'm so hungry after training that I, I can't just eat healthy food. You know, I need more calories because healthy food fills you up too much, especially on a vegan diet. It's a lot of fiber and so forth. So I, like my coach, Mark Philippi said, hey, if you want to get really strong, you got to eat ice cream. <laughs> and, and so my, my attitude is you can, you can, I think what you, you you always said it best. You said it's not what you eat, it's when you eat it, right? That was your saying. And I think once I've had a really healthy meal full of fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds, just tons of micronutrients, you know, after that, if I have coconut ice cream or some dessert and all that, and this is all after training like a savage, it's not something I'm concerned about at all. I, I have no guilt whatsoever in my food choices, none whatsoever. I eat what I want whenever I want it, period. Because you prepare your body, you depleted yourself. It's a right. key. energy depletion. Guys, understand, deplete your energy. Don't load it. Right. Your body instinctively will reload when you give it a chance. Deplete your energy. Think about it. You don't even need to think about it. Everything you do is programmed to enjoy this stuff. You wake up in the morning to do your job. You have an interesting challenge, even cognitive or mental, to resolve. Right. You can do anything, whether you're a mathematician or whether you're a mechanic or when you're an athlete. Right. You are in a state of depleted energy and don't be afraid to do that. Right. There are many people who eat before activity. It's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. You don't need to. Your body has amazing resources and it will be very happy to train, to walk and burn fat to provide you the energy that you need. In fact, there are so many other mechanisms that help you to utilize energy while you don't eat under stress. Right. It is, it's funny what, what you mentioned now with the ice cream because I'm now moving personally to va toward vegan. My diet was 50% vegan. It's now close to 80%. Wow. And some days close to 100%. Yeah. But I don't, I set myself free of the mission 
to be build muscle or to become big. I'm not even worried about it. Right. I just wanna my main objective today, and I believe everyone at a certain point in life should start thinking about it. The main objective is to beat the aging process and live long, but beat it successfully, not with operation, right. not with drugs, and not with some kind of weird ritual that has nothing to do with reality. Right. You don't need to do weird stuff. You don't even need weird herbs. Yeah. All you need is to decide that you're going to beat the aging process by applying the right amount of stress on yourself, whether it's nutritional or physical, and make the right food choices. Yes, moving from flesh eating into veganism or vegetarian diet is extremely, extremely beneficial. Every research now shows that even the wrong protein can eat you. Yeah. Now, when you're young, you're not so worried about it. But at a certain point, and I'm not saying so late, I'm saying late 30s, mid 40s, Yeah. the body becoming now on a twilight zone of struggling with the first sign of aging, for some people it starts much earlier. Why waiting for a crisis to happen? Right. right. Why not adapting now? We all live to the future. What's the point of you, Mike? I'm not saying you personally. Any athlete out there, any person in fitness, investing so much energy to be in shape, to look good, to build a career, and suddenly the aging strike you and you look like crap. Yeah. I mean... I'm talking about facts. I don't want to mention names. It's up to you. Oh, well, come on. Let's mention some names here. <laughs> I saw some champion trick athletes. Um, there was one 100-meter champion, Russian Vladimir Brozov. He's a great guy. He was specimen, become obese. I show boxers who became obese, great shape. Look at Duran. Yeah. I admire him. I think the it's guy was average. Look how he end up. Yeah. And well, why do you think that is? Because they that's don't need law. Because what they do, they didn't know how to switch from the time of training to the post training. Right. They let it go because all other athletes next to them become soft or obese, and many of them suffer from high blood pressure. This and many of them don't even live long. I gave a list of athletes who are specimen. Yeah. Mike yeah. Who, who died very young. Yeah. There's no reason. There is no reason in what they are too but they I mean there is no reason to finish like this. But there were reason, and the two of them, bad diet and also overtraining. That means these people cross the threshold of stress. It finished their mileage. It exhausted them. It happened to soldiers too. One of the key principles of survival is not to overdo your stress. Don't ever allow yourself to be under chronic stress. Never. Always take a break. Whatever you do, nutritional stress, that's why I created at this time what I call intermittent fasting, the warrior diet. You don't, it's not even good to eat, to fast or eat every other day. It's way too long, in my opinion. Oh, it I agree. Create chronic stress. Yeah, no doubt. So your endocrine system is not built for that. We are right. still evolved to do very well on the circadian clock. So the circadian clock is not perfect. So what? Our hormone is supposed to act accordingly. Our sex hormone, I'm talking especially about testosterone, is extremely sensitive. You can lose it very fast during abuse. 
Yeah. Very fast. And that's an asset, not just for men, for women too. For women too. Absolutely. So if you abuse yourself with the right diet, if you abuse yourself with lack of stress, or if you abuse yourself with too much chronic stress, in any case, you are setting yourself up to a failure. That's such an interesting statement, abusing yourself with lack of stress, because stress is crucial to reach your full potential. So the very thing that people try to avoid is often exactly what you need to make it to that, to level up, to get to that next point, to improve yourself. I mean, I look at any stressful event I ever had in my life at the time of the stress, obviously it's not fun, but it transformed me in a positive way, or at least I made it transform me in a positive way. And I wouldn't be who I am without it. And you know what? What you see is what you get. You look very strong. You look great, Mike. Actually, I, I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. And it's better than ever. Thank One you. question Thank you. for you. How as a complete vegan, you are 100% vegan, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. how did you manage to build such a size of muscle? Can you tell us what exactly do you do? Is the amount of protein that you eat critical? What did you do to build such a size? What are you doing? Well, I mean, what I do now is quite a bit different than what I did. I've been on a vegan diet for 26 years, and then I was vegetarian for many years before that. So since I was 15, and I'm 46 now. So I haven't had meat since I was 15. I had a little bit of fish after I, when I first became vegetarian. My mother was vegetarian too, but she had, she had some dairy, Indian woman, she had some dairy in her diet, and she ate a little bit of fish. So when I said I wanted the transition, yeah. So when I said I wanted the transition to a vegetarian diet, she recommended just cut out all the meats except for fish. Just keep that in for a little bit. Keep eating eggs. Keep eating dairy, and then transition from there if you want. So I did that for a couple of years, and then I learned about factory farming, and I got into vegetarianism for ethical reasons because a love of animals, not because I thought it was some superior way to eat for physical performance. Because I wasn't even into physical performance at that stage of my life. So I got into it that for that for that reason. And then when I learned about what happens in factory farms, I, I couldn't justify continuing to consume dairy and eggs because that those industries are super cruel. So, at, so when I was around 20, I was in Oregon, Lewis and Clark College, and that's when I was first exposed to 100% plant-based eating or vegan diets. You know, Oregon's always been very progressive. I mean, they had Starbucks and stuff like that a decade before it spread everywhere else. That coffee culture of meeting up with people at a coffee shop. We never saw that back east. If you wanted coffee back east, you went to a restaurant or you went to a diner and it was black coffee with cream and sugar or with, with cream or sugar, that was it. Some, some variation of those three ingredients, that was it. No one actually went to a place where you just had coffee there in a wide variety of it. So I got into the, I got into the vegan diet then and I was lifting weights. But then I, what I was trying to do was emulate what meat eaters do because I had no reference point of how to build size and strength on a vegan diet. No one was putting out information, at least not that I was aware of. The internet was out there, but it was really nascent. It's not like it is now. So I looked at how people in bodybuilding magazines eat. And I'm still eating five, six times a day, as they recommend in there. And I'm going, okay, I need this much protein. I need to try to get a gram of protein per lean pound of body mass. And then I need to eat this, and need to eat that, and so forth. Now, that all worked to some extent. But honestly, my opinion of protein is so much different now than it was then. I, I think protein is the most overstated ingredients that we eat, especially among men. All they think about is fucking protein. How much, oh, how do I get more protein? How do I get this? As if there's continually beneficial returns to more to aggrandizing more and more protein intake. Now my take is, is that at my size now, about 197, 198, I'm stronger than I've ever been. And I deadlifted 550 pounds for three reps last week. I deadlifted 600 pounds last month. And this is after doing your controlled fatigue stuff. This is after doing interval training. So I'm fatigued. And then I go lift some fucking heavy weights like it's nothing. I'm at a lighter body weight. And I'm only eating about 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. And that's my estimate. I don't count this stuff. That's just what I think it is. It could be lower than that. It might be a little bit higher on some days. But I don't think about it. I just eat healthy food. I just put together real food as much as possible. 
and I don't worry about protein intake. So how I got this big and strong is, well, you know, I'm half Indian, so I've got I've got the blood of Hindu gods in my bloodstream. You know, I just channel my inner Hanuman, and I can move weights. But uh, I think I think the most important thing to getting bigger and stronger is you actually know what you're doing training wise. Nutrition is obviously important, but a lot of people a lot of people think they know a lot about nutrition, and they their whole day revolves around eating. But then you look at the way they train; they train like a, a little bitch. You're not training hard. It's like, why do you need 300 grams of protein for this little dipshit workout you're doing? So I think that we get a lot of bad advice on these things. I find that more important than protein intake or any of that stuff is optimizing a hormonal environment. So if my testosterone is good, if my DHT is good, if my growth hormone's good, I'm sleeping well, my training is going to come together. Yes. I yes. feel good. I feel great. You're absolutely right, and I'm glad that you mentioned it because for for a long time, I believe that the protein, high protein diet is a myth, absolutely unnecessary. So unless you choose to be on a natural high protein diet because you don't want to eat processed carbohydrates, right. which I understand, fine, but just be as vegan as possible. Well, because what do you think about stuff such as the carnivore diet, which is really big right now? Are you familiar I with that? <laughs> I think it's a deadly diet. I think it's a deadly diet. I think that this diet will age people, let alone its careless diet. Uh, I'm not surprised in time like today when politics is so careless as, uh, as far as human life. Right. Your life was so, we're never so underestimated. We became our society guinea pigs of politicians who decide that they can say whatever they want just in order to be gain power or get elected and basically people life become nothing right when 200,000 people over 200,000 are already dead in less than a year and right. people just feel that this is just a new routine it makes me worry yeah. so this is the same society that brought you the carnivore diet. I know myself, you know some people who fell victim to this diet. Uh, there's plenty of research to show the correlation between meat eating or imbalanced diet, high blood lipid, high cholesterol, yeah. tendency to cardiovascular disease and high mortality. Well, why do you think some people feel better when they transition to it? Because we hear that a lot. Oh, I feel so great on this diet. Do you think that's just a temporary thing? It's not going to last? Like, listen, many people feel great when they eat something sweet. I myself, after training, even if I eat anything sweet, I immediately feel the high. That doesn't mean that this is a good the sugar is good for me. Right. It give yeah. you a high. Look, meat is addictive. Yeah. Many, many animal protein, including dairy, know that they have inside narcotic-like protein or compound that bind to opioid receptors in your brain and make you feel happy. They raise dopamine. Meat also um, is full of iron, one of the best source of iron. And traditionally, it's been conceived that it's the animal in you. Mike, you believe in hard earning, animalism, hard earning, aggressiveness, true productive aggressive lifestyle to improve yourself, to challenge yourself. Eating meat is a shortcut for the dumb person. For Sorry for my expression, guys, meat eaters, I know you're great guys. But it doesn't make you men more manly or female more brave when you eat meat. Right. None of that. It's just a myth. Some of the greatest people on earth, including the Spartan, were not big meat eaters at all. 
And when you look again, I'm not Christian, but I came from a place where the early Jews avoiding actually eating meat, including the tribe of the Arsene, where Jesus belonged, came from, to, to not violate the kosher rule. Even the killing of the animal is not something that is encouraged. By Judaism, only one person can do it. You're not, you're not even supposed to eat all kind of flesh. Right. Many of them are just not allowed. I know that in Indian tradition, the beef is not allowed because the cow, the cattle, is a sacred right. animal. Remember that years ago we talked about trying to bring dairy from sacred yeah. cows. In fact, yeah, I, I remember. That. Have, I still enjoy the idea. I wish I could. Possibly, we could raise cows just to bring milk. A very successful trial like this happened in Italy. The cows are only for dairy. They are treated like I treat my own dogs. Right. They retire peacefully. Probably will be cremated. It's being done without hurting the environment. But they are not going to be ever used for flesh eating. And that kind of dairy, I would really, really endorse. And I'm sure that a lot of vegans like yourself morally will endorse a, a system that will stop euthanizing or killing animals, yeah. but rather use the milk or use the eggs, etc. Yeah. So I didn't go as far as you because I guess I'm not feeling sorry yet for the fish, <laughs> the way I feel for the mammals. Right, right. Well, these fish is the healthiest of meats if you're going to keep eating flesh. Think about it, uh, eggs. I think, see, there's actually a place in Vegas called, I believe it's called Spring Valley Reserve, and it's, it's somewhat of an animal sanctuary. There's all kinds of animals that are taken care of there. Now, they have legitimate free-range chickens. These chickens are just running around having a good time, and they lay eggs, and this place sells those eggs. Now, I wouldn't have any moral conflict to consuming those eggs, given the conditions. That, that's exactly the point, because the moral part is a very important part. We live in a world that we are not alone. Right. We live here with nature around us, and we cannot play dumb. We cannot overlook what is happening. Right. Um, I cannot tell people to stop eating beef. In fact, I can't even tell my own family to. <laughs> I, I believe in freedom of choice. Sure, but, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, but over time, people would take, I hope, the right decision because me personally, and that's not science, I believe in karma. I really do. What you give, you get back. Yeah. And the harm that you cause eventually will come back to you. So yeah, now when you eat fish, because I mean, the big argument against eating fish is the fact that the oceans are being depleted of fish. There may not be any fish in the years to come, and that's going to create havoc on the environment and all that. Well, when you eat fish, how do you source it? Do you get wild caught salmon? What do you do to, to get the best options? Uh, you know what? I'm far from being perfect. And you just raised something that I'm still in a dilemma because I eat only virtually wild caught catch fish. Yeah. Even as a kid, we were eating river fish that was wild caught. So, I, and I believe that this is the way to do it. However, that does not justify the destruction of salmon species and tuna species, which are becoming now more and more depleted. Right. And, um, I'm very concerned about it to the point. Sulfur cow species, I don't eat, don't touch at all. But I'm concerned, I have to tell you, I'm very concerned about it. I'm far away from being perfect. And yeah, that's never sorry. Never sorry. It's on your mind, though. It's something you're thinking about. And, that, and that's important. I used to fish with my dad growing up. So, I mean, that was wild caught because we would catch fish in Montana. And I remember that the fish that we caught, it was night and day, the taste, compared to what you would get at the store. I mean, it was because this is about as fresh as you could get. You just caught it that day. You're eating it that night. And it's coming out of a actual natural environment. It's not coming out of a fish farm, something like that. 
huge and it difference. tasted really good huge difference there's no question in my mind though that said if you look at a typical atlantic or even farm raised salmon today cooking methods and stuff like this make things taste very good right so right most people will not even realize the difference but that being said i believe that currently the biggest problem that happened is happened to the mammals the killing of the beef especially is the worst problem we face sheep do right the right. resources that you take yes rid of the methane gas the unhealthy habit of doing it all of this accumulate into a serious problem and the waste we are not anymore a hunter gatherer or gatherer hunter society the people just hunt and eat what they eat. people basically waste kill ammo which is going to the garbage it's not even recycled a lot of material and food is being thrown today um and that's not a good thing so I, I, I truly believe that going back to a frugal lifestyle, when you really sense a real hunger, you follow intermittent fasting, you don't eat during the day, you exercise, you deplete, you will gain a true sense of hunger. Yeah. And even, even beans and frugal food, whole food, would taste amazing. Yeah, that's it, right. It, you don't need... No. Maybe the, the once in a while, yeah, once in a while, spice, I, yeah, spice is hunger. The best spice in the world is hunger. I've, I've gone hiking all day before where you come home famished, you can't wait to eat. Whatever I make is the best tasting meal I've ever had because you're, you're, you're just ready to soak in. In fact, I think a lot of times when people say they're bored with food, it's because they're eating too often. You know, it's absolutely, it's true. It is very true. So I say, guys, Give yourself a true sense of hunger, at least for a week or two, several days, and then start to decide and switch to the good vegetarian food, whole right. food. Right. Cook yourself anything from broccoli to cauliflower. If you want to keep in the beginning some cheese or egg, do it. But gradually, train your body when you are hungry to switch away from the flesh food. Yeah. Not only that you're going to save yourself, you're going to save the environment, and you're going to save the poor animal. And you know what? There's another phenomenon. And we have it here because we live in an area that is called farm. In, here in California, people raise chicken and turkeys, and they have names, and they don't kill them. They cannot kill them. Same people who shop in the supermarket and buy the meat, but they won't kill their own animals. There's some kind of an awareness that you see even stronger among children that animals are cute. Right. That there is something inside us that can adapt them. You can see videos on goats and baby goats and even pigs. They are very intelligent animals. Yeah. So when you raise them, there's no way you can kill them. Right. However, it's so easy to go to the supermarket, look like something that looked like a slab of meat and forget where it came from. Absolutely. You know, especially with young animals. So the awareness of the life rights or rights, life matters, for anyone, also for animals. Yeah. And, and we, should, we should keep them alive. We should be in a society that should treat we human with dignity, all kind of humans, all kind of humans, but also animals. It's very, very important. And I believe... I think compassion is something that you know, so to me, my greatest strength is my compassion. That's what I always say. People talk about what I can lift and what I can do here and there. I go, that's nothing compared to the compassion I have and being a generous person and helping people and animals. That's what I feel is my greatest asset. But I think a lot of men are discouraged from being compassionate, especially now. We don't have a lot. A lot of men are growing up without 
positive male role models. So they get a lot of bad advice. A lot of men talk to women in a really disrespectful, derogatory manner, which shows lack of self-respect, right? Like my wife always says, guys who act like that, they don't like themselves. That's the problem. And it just comes out from there. It goes we, very we far. We get a lot of advice on what's considered. So eating meat, for example, is considered a form, that, that's considered a manly activity. I'm gonna go to a barbecue, I'm gonna have some steak. And if I don't have it, my friends are gonna make fun of me. So I, so I, 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 you know, I have to play a game. You know, having a beer is considered very masculine, even though beer is highly estrogenic. Very it's considered, a, it's considered a masculine activity. Have a beer with the, we're going to go have a beer with the bros. Like, well, you might as well have a fucking birth control pill too while you're there. So we get a lot of bad, you know, we get a lot of bad advice on what true masculinity actually is. And what I see is a lot of men overcompensating for lack of masculinity. They're just emblematic of being betas and they try to project strength but the yeah. fact that they even have to project it means they don't have it unfortunately our society is still men oriented but becoming more and more feminine and the right. compensation is everywhere and it was like this before mike um not a new thing it's not a new thing yeah uh, it, it is not a new thing, and it is... Well, let me say one thing. I remember as a kid flying on an airplane, right? Remember Pan Am? <laughs> I remember flying on Pan Am as a kid, and I remember the way men on these flights would interact with the flight attendants. I mean, they would have their hand around them, and sometimes they would, they would pinch their glutes. Walk, they, they would pinch their ass as they walked by, or they would slap it, and women just felt like they had to put up with it. It was really disgusting. But that was that was just considered normal behavior back then. It's like, you oh, it's just man. The movie. Yeah. You can see it in the movies. The cool yeah. cowboy is the guy who go in the bar and you know and uh, tease the women, and they make sure in the wild west that there are holes around in any bars. Right. So, right. so you have time as a man. Yeah. It does not. So that's a not new phenomenon. What, what really bothers me is that the whole society take part of this game. Right. Women do create families with men like this. Yes. And they accept it. Um, men like this many times due to insecurity also segregate themselves. They yeah. believe that people who don't look like self are a threat. So that can also explain why in our society bigotry and racism is still so strong. Yeah. And people feel threatened because they're insecure. If they were secure, they wouldn't feel like this. Right. That's right. You know, I had, um, when I wrote the, my last book, The Seven Principles of Stress, that was an interesting phenomenon. I was invited to do some lecture in Northern California in some kind of a library. And um, there were actually a decent amount, a couple of hundred people there. You know, I did move from one place to another. And in the end, they asked questions. And um, in one of the chapters of my book, which is about adaptation to stress and how natural selection actually encourage development of the species, improvement of the species when it's widely exposed to stress. Right. So hard to say, but the weak die, the strong survive. It sounds very banal, but the new generation, for other reasons too, becoming stronger. It happened in wild species of animal. It happened to humans too. So one of the example, which raised a lot of emotion here, is that because of slavery, black people in America become physically more advanced than mm. white people. Because of the hardship of 
couple of hundred of years. Yeah. Brutal hardship. Absolutely. Hard natural selection. Those new generations will survive becoming physically more advanced, and you can see it today among black athletes, especially in football or basketball. That doesn't mean that Caucasian or white people cannot be specimen. It just in right. general. So there was one guy who stood up. He was red from anger, Mike. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> he started to talk about third world countries. In um, He mentioned, I believe, South America. He meant or probably India too and other sure. areas. Third world country, you know, people are smaller in size and this. And then I said to myself, what that has to do with natural selection? But it's not even true. But it's interesting that in biology, size has nothing to do how right. tall you are, yeah. with how strong you are and how resilient you are and how long you can live. Right. In fact, the Roman, the mighty Roman soldier, was 5'6", average, and below. Alexander the Great was 5'4". His father was 5'6", or something like this. So, these mighty people used to fight face-to-face -face against a Vandal, or a Visigoth, or a German, and still beat them with a short sword. The Spartans were not relatively taller, but top maybe 5'8". Right. Top. And that was supposed to be big. So, <laughs> you know, it has nothing. We have so many myths and emotional involvement about who we are as human beings that we lost the priority and the values and the objective of what do we want to achieve. Instead of I, I myself as an individual, as a unique individual, we are seeking to do something here. We talk about we. It's yeah. called really we. Men, especially, want to belong to a group. Right. Because by himself, he's afraid to be. Freud called it the men of the crowd. You're afraid to be alone. Yeah. You're afraid to be an individual. You know, that's I mean, that's definitely true. And I, I have a unique perspective on a lot of things, especially that as well as race, because I'm half Indian, I'm half white. I don't look Indian at all, though. I've, I've never had an Indian in my life come up to me and ask me if I'm Indian or say, oh, what part is of India is your mother from? Never, never, it's never happened. So uh, I, I am not accepted as a white person. I'm not accepted as an Indian person, even though I'm both of those things. So I, I'm not comfortable in the white man's world. And I'm not comfortable in the Indian man's world, even though I'm both of those things. Now, what's interesting is I'm often perceived as black or African-American. You know, I've been called the N-word probably a dozen times throughout my life. Seriously? Yeah. I've had people that are blatantly racist come at me with their them and like their just absolute hatred of black people perceiving me as a black person. Now, the plus side is that black women love me. <laughs> so everything has a silver lining. <laughs> you know? Hence why my wife is black, because black women try to talk to me more than any other woman out there by far. And black women are really strong and aggressive. And, and, I, and I like all that. I like their energy. But it, it gives me an interesting perspective, because in a lot of ways, I know what it's like to be a black man more than I know what it's like to be what I actually am, half white, half Indian, because I'm not perceived as either one of those things. And I've been perceived as other ethnicities before, Middle Eastern. I've been perceived as, I don't know, South American. But general, but, but more than not, I'm perceived as black or African American. So my experience in terms, it's, it, it doesn't even really matter what I am in terms of my ethnic background, what matters is how I'm perceived, because that's going to be my experience. Wait, we ever stopped by cops for, for racial profiling? Yes, I have. I'll tell you a story. One time, 
my father and I, and when I was in high school, I had dreadlocks down to my chest, which made me look even more black, right? So we're, we're, when I went to college, we were looking at a couple different places, and my dad and I went on a road trip. I had these big headphones on because this is before anyone had, we didn't have a car stereo with a, a cassette or an eight track. So I just listened to my own music. This police officer going in the other direction on the highway saw that I had headphones on and that's a, that's a traffic violation. So he pulled me over. He asked me to come back to the squad car. I'm about 17 at this point, maybe 18. He wanted to talk to me privately in the squad car. White police officer. He asked me, who's the guy in the car with you? And I said, that's my father. And he goes, but he's not black. But he didn't say black. He said another word, you know, which I'm not going to repeat. Wow. And he looked at me like, uh, like, no way that's your father. Interesting. And he, was, and he was very racist in terms of what he went on to say. And it was shocking to me at the time. But I had dealt with racism a lot at the time. So it wasn't something that I hadn't been exposed to before. So anyway, suffice to say, he gave me a $150 ticket and I'm on my way. You know, that's one time. Another time I was standing in front of a record store. I was waiting for my grandmother to pick me up. Two police officers who expressed themselves as undercover police officers came running in my direction. And they said, there is, there is a complaint from a neighbor and there's no house to be seen in this area, right? This is a industrial area. They go, we're getting some complaints that a black man is looking at people's homes with binoculars. Black man being me. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, 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 even then I realized that being hostile or confrontational with police officers is not gonna work in my favor. So I always had to stay very calm and cool and collected. And I just said, hey, I, I'm just, I was just in this store. I bought some CDs. I'm waiting for my grandmother to pick me up. That's all I'm doing is standing here. I don't have any binoculars on me. I don't have any weapon on me. I don't have anything on me. And even after these guys realized that they were in the wrong, when they left, they said, don't try not to look so suspicious next time is what they said as they walked away. Now, I've got way more stories than that. Those are just two examples. I could keep going with this. So, yes, I, when I hear these stories about people dealing with racial profiling, a lot of white people find it hard to believe that. They're like, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't happen to them. You know, if you're a white person, you don't understand racism because it's not I'm, I'm talking about systemic racism. I'm not talking about prejudice. Right. Everyone can, can experience prejudice. But I. If you're a white person, you're not experiencing systemic racism. So when a black man is pulled over because he's a black man and he's treated in a certain way, that's a, that's the form of systemic racism now. That's what that person's experiencing. So it's often hard for people to understand things that they've never experienced. They're like, well, that's never happened to me. It's probably never happened to anyone else. So now we think, oh, all these black people are just complaining and, you know, why can't they get it together? We hear these stupid arguments that have been going on forever. But that's a form of white privilege, whether they realize it or not. It's a form of white privilege to get in your car and go drive around a nice neighborhood and not get pulled over. I, I wonder what's your opinion. Something that I'm just thinking about. And... Um, is more and more it becoming more and more clear that as a black person your life is in danger anyway yeah. yeah they can stop you and kill you for no reason yeah regardless to what you do and how old you are that's right do you believe that being such being black, you have the right to defend yourself? I think everyone has the right to defend themselves when they're being confronted, no doubt about it. But I think, I think more than the problem of racism is the lack of power. And what I mean by that is, if Will Smith, one of the most famous actors in the world, a black man, gets pulled over by the police, he's gonna have a much different experience than, let's say, a, a poor black man from the north side of Las Vegas. And the reason why is because he has power. So in a lot of ways, it's a classist type thing more than it is racism. And to be fair to police officers, because I'm not trying to be hard on police officers. I have a lot of friends that are police officers, and I've had good experiences with police officers, more good than bad. In fact, I've been pulled over two times in Las Vegas. 
one time in my neighborhood, not my actual neighborhood, but the, the community. And the pli- I was very friendly. The police officer, a white man, was very friendly. He didn't make me feel uncomfortable at all. And he just gave me a warning and let me go. Another time I got pulled over because I won a bet watching a UFC match. So I, I got on my phone to call Carol. And the second I got on the phone, this police officer pulled me over. Same thing. I was very polite to him. He was very polite. He just let me go with the warning. So I'm not saying that you know, every police officer is racist, because I definitely don't believe that. Certainly not now. But this kind of racial profiling still definitely happens. And it's if for someone who hasn't experienced it, you, you don't realize how not only is it scary, but it, it's really humiliating, too. It's really I, humiliating to be in a position where, you know, the other person has all the power in terms of the law on their side. So, yeah, yeah. you can defend yourself. And if this person tries to put his hands on you in a way that is unacceptable, you probably should defend yourself. But there's going to be serious legal repercussions to defending yourself, too. Now, survival is the most important thing. You'll worry about the legal consequences later. But there will be legal consequences, no doubt about it. Um, I, I want to share with you, I had also personally fair experience with police people. Um, we adopt dogs here, we rescue dogs, and there was an incident where I had, I had dogs and cats, and my dogs a cat attack the cats, nothing happened. But as I tried to separate between them, in fact, the cat injured the dog. Wow. <laughs> the cat was a, a warrior. Yeah. And uh, he was attacked by two pit bull dogs, and he injured both of them. Wow. Yeah, he did. but anyway, I interfere, but the dog didn't want to let it go. So I was jumping on one of my, she's now old, big people dog, Lola. She was and uh, basically ground, but I basically cut my knees while doing it. And when I stopped her, somehow we managed to separate the cat from the dogs, took him to my office. But the neighbor, there were a lot of hustle and barking and this and screaming. So the neighbor, of course, called the police. The police came. And I was really worried they're going to take the dogs and they can utilize them. Yeah, yeah. So I explained. He said, what happened to your knees? I told him the truth. You know, I had to mount the dog and submit her and nothing bad happened i can show you the cat everything is fine they were very nice they were very understanding despite the neighbor complaint they let it go and i remember i even gave them two protein shakes that we used to produce <laughs> yeah. so I, I had some good experience yeah sure but at the same time see what happened around. I would say that in the army and the police force, there are at least as many black people as white people. Don't you agree with me? I think so. Now, what happened? One of my dogs was barking because we had a package dropped off, so I just had to get that. That's okay. <laughs> I'm by myself here, so it got to multitask. Are you okay. <laughs> All good. Anyway, it, you know, I just wonder why is it when a black people been attacked by cops? Where are the black people, black cops? Why nobody's doing nothing? Are they all ganging together? Why is it even happening? Is there no balance system here? Well, I'll tell you a story that, speaking of the Nation of Islam, going back to that, I was watching a lecture by one of their ministers, right? This guy named Nuri Muhammad, interesting guy. And he basically is saying that if you see a black woman getting assaulted by a police officer, you need to, instead of filming it with your phone, You need to turn that phone on yourself and say goodbye to your wife and your family because you're about to intervene in something that's going to potentially get you killed, if not arrested. He goes, you should you you 
you you can't you you have to intervene in a situation like that is his point as he's like as a black man you don't let anyone touch a black woman like that is his point i don't care who it is you have to draw that line in the sand now that's considered controversial from some people but i don't really understand why it's controversial because if a police officer is breaking the law now because you're insulting a person you're breaking the law that police officer is now a criminal but and the way you would stop a criminal i mean if you say you're gonna see it if you see a criminal assaulting someone not too many people are going to say that, oh, yeah, you shouldn't intervene in that. Most people are going to say you should intervene, even if whether they would or not is different. But most people are going to say, oh, yeah, you should intervene. But if a police officer is acting like a criminal, somehow it's OK because it's a police officer or you shouldn't intervene or you're afraid to intervene. And I understand all of that. You feel like if you intervene, you know, who's going to what's going to happen to you now? But at, at some point in life, you have to everyone's going to die. No, but I'm going to die one time, not as a coward. You know, I'd rather die today as a man than, than, than not be a man and live for another 20 years. But I got to live with the fact that I was a coward and I didn't do anything in a situation where I could have done something. I appreciate what you say. It's very unique because most people don't think this way. They believe that... They don't want to die, maybe because they have family yeah. taken care of and other priorities. But at the same time, we were raised to believe that humanity is supposed to protect itself and that justice must be done and not just in court. Right. Not to protect the innocent. It's written in the Bible. Yeah. And um, I mean, so what, I mean, for me, whatever it is, if it's a kid being assaulted, I'm going to intervene. If it's a dog being assaulted, assaulted I'm going to intervene. It's, I don't even have to ask myself what I would do in that situation. I know what I would do in that situation. It would be automatic. It wouldn't, I wouldn't even have a chance to think about it. I think it's going beyond thinking. I um, had a discussion like this before, and I agree with you. I think that if you're trained to do it, you don't think at that moment. You yeah. don't. At the same time, when you look at the facts, nothing happened. People are just being murdered on the street. Nobody interfere. In the in this case, they scream or they make some videos, and it's a very interesting phenomena to watch today, where you know that this society can be aggressive. It doesn't matter the color of the skin. Yeah. People can be black, white, Asian, African, whatever it is. All human can kill. All human can defend themselves. All human can do something. Why is it that some people become the aggressors and some become prey? It's a good question. Right. right. You know? So... I'm not advocating anything, I'm just asking the question. Why is it, is it that our society was raised this way? To be so complacent when things, and just to make noise and protest all the time? In complacency is not a good thing. No, it's not. Uh, it's. I, I don't want to say Jewish tradition by, by the Kabbalah, which is the highest level of Jewish belief or mysticism, uh -huh. the wisdom of uncoding the words of the Torah. Complacency is a crime. Yeah, it is. It's a it sin. You're not supposed to be complacent ever. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's that famous saying that evil persists because good men do nothing. That's right. I don't want to ever be known as the man who did nothing. You know, is when I think about that. You're like, right. If you were in that situation. What did you do? Oh, you know, I filmed it. <laughs> yeah. And that what gave some of the worst people in the world the opportunity to rise. Right. Exactly. From Hitler to Stalin to Mussolini is yeah. the 
complacencies of the people yes that, that they group so easy into a dumb factor mess of people who don't think just react and say thing nothing original think that they learn slow right. yeah most of these people are complacent they are not individuals they are basically people of the crowd who react and you see it in any area of life in politics in the way people behave the industry is crowd oriented very little attention is done to the individual i personally believe that it's time to raise the flag of the individuals it's time now to encourage people to be in tune with themselves each of us is different right and our priority change with age with time time is a critical factor this yeah. time for everything we need to communicate in a way that give respect to the individual yeah it's not just about what you think or what you thought that you heard that is true but what the other people what the other person think his story is as important and and that by itself is critically important but i'm not just trying to be moral here right just be true to yourself because you as an individual have the right to uh sorry that's coming from my end i thought i turned this off but uh that okay. it's over <laughs> yeah uh, so somehow my phone is synced with my computer so when i get a text i thought i turned my phone off when i get a text i get alerted here so let me just make sure that's shut off it's okay we continue next time no 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 i don't i don't have to go yeah i, I want to keep talking to you yeah okay um you tell me when it's okay yeah yeah we're good now we're good now sorry about that all i'm saying you don't respect the individual the other individual you don't respect yourself if you don't give yourself the chance to live the best life possible that you could yeah you're missing life you're yeah. missing life and you're going to end up like everybody else dependent on drugs dependent on the doctor dealing with all the typical age related diseases because you behave like anyone else and guess what mike in the end of the day you're right about this everybody die you die by yourself yeah and you don't want to die with no legacy or alone you know what i give this privilege even to my animals my animals they get a lot of love until the last moment uh, you know what it's true it's true that's another subject maybe for some other time but when I, i'm losing an animal it's like losing a child yeah it's horrible it, it is horrible we have deep inside compassion and love to the innocent and to the pure and deep inside every person at least have a good seed some people gave up on that i believe that some people or many among us have no soul anymore yeah that just walking evil ready to be molded into something very negative yeah but there are also many great people among us yeah great people I think it's strong. I think it's important to develop a strong code of conduct. How do you want to conduct yourself in this world? What do you believe in, and how do you want to conduct yourself? Now, I have a degree in religious studies, and I focused on Islamic mysticism, Hinduism, Buddhism. I started with Hinduism because that, I was already interested in that. But what captivated me the most was Islamic mysticism, Sufism, and it still does to this day. But through studying all these different philosophies, you start developing a code of this is how I want to conduct myself. This is the kind of person I want to be. These are the kind of compromises I don't want to make. This is how I want to live my life. And what you're talking about that complacency. Before I got into what I do now, before I got into the fitness industry, I was just doing regular jobs like everybody else, corporate jobs. I was married to a toxic woman, horrible person. Really? I had stress on all levels. I had stress in my personal life and I had I, I didn't like what I was making decent money, but I didn't like what I was doing at all. I mean, I had 
So I, I just I just felt like I wasn't even alive. I remember driving to work some days. I would just think, you know what? If the car skidded off the road right now and I died, wouldn't be that big of a deal <laughs> because life was just not that meaningful. And I'm, I'm prone to depression as it is. I've had depressions for as long as I can remember. And stuff like this obviously makes the depression way worse. When your personal life is under stress and when your professional life is under stress, what else is there? You know, you're, you're under a lot of stress. And I remember the best day of my life probably is when I got fired from the last job I ever had. And the guy I used to work for, who was not a good guy, but gave me a good parting advice. He said, you're a natural entrepreneur. You know, that's where you're going to shine. And he wasn't saying this for my benefit. He, he was a slime bag. I won't get into his story. But what he said was actually correct. And once once I got into what I what I do now is different than what I did when I first started. But it's it's the first time I ever did something I actually wanted to do for a living or at least attempt it. And just attempting it all of a sudden transformed me. I just carried myself differently. I would wake up excited now about doing things. This is when I started interviewing people like you. I mean, maybe within two weeks of getting laid off from that job, I was I had interviewed you. I had interviewed MMA legend Frank Shamrock. I had interviewed Steve Maxwell, who I became friends with. I interviewed all these really interesting people that were doing interesting things. And that was very invigorating and encouraging because I'd go, I'm, I'm now I'm interacting with people that are actually doing impressive stuff. And I hadn't interacted with people like that before. And that further pushed me along the line of, I really want to be successful so I can be around people like that. It, for Mike's impression, Mike, and I have to give it to you, you look like a person in peace. You look like a person with a peace of mind. And in many ways, I'm jealous at you that <laughs> which I didn't reach it yet. I yeah. don't have a peace of mind. I believe that I know what gives me peace of mind. It's mostly faith. I truly, truly feel strongly that um, there are things beyond me or the physical or even the logic that are deep rooted inside me or all of us yeah and they are as important as the physical right you were attracted to study islam mysticism did you find anything about yourself in this realm of the spiritual that was triggered father did it in any way Definitely. In your faith in your destiny? Yeah, what definitely. Absolutely. Is- I mean, in Sufism, it's all about the battle within. It's all about the battle with your ego, taming your ego, connecting with your higher self as a way to be the person that reigns in your ego, because it never says that the ego should be negated. The ego is actually very important for the life experience. But when your ego runs amok without any control from your higher self, I mean, the analogy that Sufis often used is that there's a horse and a carriage and a rider. Now the rider has to be in charge of the horses, not the other way around. The horses are the ego, the riders, the higher soul. Now, if the horses are in charge, the rider has to go wherever the horses want. And the horses in this case represent the ego. And I feel that most people are just floating through life, acting on impulses from their ego, get drunk, have sex, go drive a car fast eat an unhealthy meal, right? These are all just ego-based things. You know, get gratification. Post a bunch of fucking photos on on social media so people tell you how great you are. It's like, oh, here's another picture of me with my shirt off. Look how great I look. But what, what 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 I got out of religious studies that was really useful is that you kind of understand suffering in a different context. Now, I always looked at suffering as something that you want to avoid, and I still obviously want to avoid it, but in, when you look at all these great religious figures, they all suffered a great deal to bring out the diamond that they have within. None of them had an easy path. I mean, Muhammad was driven out of his hometown. He was excommunicated. Everybody told him that, don't ever come back here. We'll kill you on sight. And he was driven out of Mecca. He went to Medina. Over the course of a decade, he gathered a following, and he 
converted all these people to Islam. And then he went back to Mecca with an army and took over, you know, in the name of God, not for his ego, you know, for his religious principles. But he suffered. Jesus, he suffered. Buddha, he suffered. These All of these people suffered. So I, I went through pretty bad. I mean, not pretty bad. It's, it's, it's really bad. But I, I went through, you know, sexual abuse when I was five years old. So when you're five years old, yeah, when you're five years old, your, your brain is not even close to being fully developed. You're not prepared for stress at that age. So it, it, has, it has a dramatic effect. I mean, the, the, it's not something I'm ever going to be over, honestly, because it, it happened at such a youthful, it happened at such a time where it, it has a permanent effect on your psychology and your endocrinology. I mean, in my opinion, it just has a permanent effect. But you, you have to learn how to channel that energy into something positive. So I always say, when I talk to other people that are survivors, people that have been abused, I say, look, you're, you're gonna come through this path in your life. You're gonna come through this path where you embrace hatred because of what happened to you, or you embrace compassion because of what happened to you. The hatred path is only gonna end one way. It's not gonna be good. You're gonna hurt yourself or you're gonna hurt other people or both. The compassion path is the only way you heal. You help other people, you help yourself. But I always say that you're, you're ne this is never going to be something that you're over, at least not for me. I've talked to therapists about it. And, and that's, that's a burden to carry, and I carry that burden. But I try to use it as a transformative thing as well. I go, because I've been through this, I'm way more empathetic to the suffering of others. You know, that's why I'm on a vegan diet, because I can empathize with their suffering. That's why I help kids with... Project Child Save, or an organization that saves kids from human trafficking. Because when I hear these stories, it's not abstract to me. I mean, obviously, I didn't go through what they did, but I, but I understand to some extent what they go through. So it's not abstract to me. And I know how difficult it is. And it makes me extremely motivated to help them save these kids. Now, I don't know if I would be the person I am without some of these horrific experiences I've gone through. That's the part that's that kind of blows my mind is that that was probably the worst. I mean, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me, but I wouldn't be who I am either if it didn't happen. And I really like who I am now and I like my life now. So that's I mean, that's the that's the psychological conundrum that you deal with with abuse. But when you're five years old and you're abused, you carry a lot of shame with that as well. And it's completely irrational because you're five years old. But it, it doesn't matter if it's irrational or not, because you, you, you store pain in your body. So certain things can trigger certain responses, whether you're aware of it or not. Absolutely. That can be really difficult to deal with. Um, this is a shock to me. I didn't know that you went through that, Mike, and I'm sorry that you, it must be very difficult to carry a memory like this. Uh, yeah. I must have some traumatic memories that I'm very afraid to talk about. Right. Nothing to do with sexual, but very traumatic. Yeah. Right this, is when, this is when you were in the military, or when did this kind of stuff happen? Started before that. And okay. Went through that. That's one of the hardest period, too. Yeah. It creates scars and unresolved issues that can haunt you during the night, sometime when you sleep. Yeah, absolutely. And it definitely design contribute to your to who you are, but I would say even more so, it's part of your destiny. And um, it could be that your destiny was determined, like I believe that individuals are chosen with a destiny. Yeah. You may even you may not even know today what is your complete destiny. You may not know. Yeah your legacy still is right there's yeah. a lot to do and we don't know but some place deep inside you know it's just very difficult to reach that level um again in jewish in the kabbalah i would say in the book of the zohar which was written revived by a genius guy, his name is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and later on with other people like Dari. 
they believe that the soul has three levels. Yeah. When you sleep, the outer level, which is called nefesh, is leaving you. And that is a very interesting phenomenon. Because when you wake up, you thank God for bringing you back with mercy, bring back your soul. You've got to recognize it that you are soul and body. While the soul is all about spiritual drawing light, it's coming from a great place, perfect place. So it's all about drawing light. It can be very destructive. The light of God is way too powerful, yeah. way too powerful. They compare it to an electric current. If you're not protected, it can kill you. Yeah. But if you know how to channel it, bring you light, it light everything, it makes you see things. And right. Enjoy life. So the whole quest is about drawing the light, but that's not an easy mission. Yeah. Because we are also in a body which is very physical, and the material has its limit. Every material eventually degrades itself by the forces of entropy. But the spiritual power realm never degrades itself. So, how do you live your life without ignoring the spiritual side when the body is so powerful and strong? Right. God gave you desire, the desire to eat, the desire to multiply. They are very strong. In fact, it is so geniusly designed that you enjoy. Right. That desire to multiply yeah. so much that it can become, it. it's so the desire to eat. In fact, our desire are very strong and they're supposed to be of the journey. So the wisdom of life is to combine the spirit and the physical desire. Never lose this balance. If anything, go towards the spirit because as you get older, your body can diminish. Yeah. So in order not to let it diminish, give him more spirit. Give your body more spirit. Use your wisdom and experience to draw wisdom, to draw the right conclusion, to be the driver of the horse of and the carriage right. rather than let right. the carriage run over you. Yeah. So that switch has to be taking place. Yeah. It's beyond that. It's the faith. It's the faith that is God. And without getting to the details of that, there's a destiny. And that destiny of yours must be good. Otherwise, you will spiral down. You've got to give it a chance. You do wrong things, you kill other people, or you are complacent to bad things and to yourself. You basically make yourself prone to lose the spiritual power that would otherwise empower you. Right. Um, my son is an athlete. He is a professional soccer player in, right now in England. Wow, that's amazing. And he needs to be in a great shape. Yeah. He himself is now realizing how much the spiritual power is critical. Yeah. It's critical. And Mike, you know from your experience, that when it's coming to even physical competition, the spirit is as critical. Yes. And um, people can have the best body in the world and muscles and whatever, and they can be crushed as fighters. And people can be lean and not as big and still show incredible performance. There's something that is far beyond the physical that we need to not just understand, seek. Yeah. 
seek the spirit and it will all coming down again to your yeah. judgment. What kind of life do you choose? What kind of life? Start to think, start to design, be in control. The most, there is, it has nothing to do with how you desire to be strong. That's okay. You can have every possible desire or physical desire in the world. It's okay. It's okay to be hungry. It's okay to eat. It's okay to have sex. It's okay, everything. But don't forget that the frame, how the world was created, is completely spiritual. The blueprint of this world is spiritual. When, you, when I look now and I see the landscape behind you, <laughs> something you can ignore. Yeah. The color of the sky, the fact that we are surrounded by incredible, beautiful world, you know, that God, we can't ignore that. We need to be part of this beauty. Not an ugly part. Good part of it. So that's where I, I agree with you also. We need to learn how to improve our lifestyle. So things work for us. Right. We minimize collision with ourselves and the rest of the world, but live with it. Right. Without helping other, without helping other species, and especially without helping ourselves. Right. That's how I feel. And it's never coming easy. It's just never coming easy. Right. And without even ignoring who you are and what your objective. You know, Mike, you said that you are now using control fatigue training. Yeah, I am. I love it. I've been doing it for many years, but even me today, I had to change my routine completely. <laughs> In fact, I had to change my diet and the training routine. Have I not doing, done it, I would not be able to continue, quite honestly. Yeah. My, I would not, my body start to fall apart, basically. So the concept remains. Same concept of applying stress, intermittent stress, but the amount, how long and what kind of stress, that needs to be questioned and adjusted if needed. Yeah, no doubt about it. I it, feel. No, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I feel it not just a, with age, just every day question yourself. Oh, no doubt about it. Do you change your routine every day if you feel? I don't. I, don't I, tr I train very instinctively at this point. I used to design programs for myself, and I would try to stick to it. Now I have an idea of where I'm going, and then I have. I mean, I definitely have an idea of what I'm going to do. Sometimes I have to modify that on the spot, good or bad. In other words, sometimes I'm going in with a certain plan of. Hold on, I'm gonna. One of my dogs has to go out, so I'm just going to talk and walk with you. Yeah. So uh, it's, I, I I train really instinctively where. Sometimes I have a plan of maybe it's supposed to be a really intense workout. And once I get there and I start going through a couple of motions, I realize, okay, this is not going to work. <laughs> so you have to modify right on the spot. I, I, I can see that. Mike, how about we'll continue next time? How about it? Yeah, yeah. If you need to go, no problem. Well, we can wrap I up. And I think your animals tell you something. No, no, no. See, what happens is one of my dogs... One of my dogs, Grover, he's on this heart medication, and it makes him have to urinate often. Oh, so he has to. So I put him out right before we started recording, but we've been on for a little bit, so he just had to go again. It's not a big deal. How old is he? He's 15, actually. Wow. Yeah. So can I see the dog? Where yeah, yeah, yeah. Once they come back in, I'll show them to you. But sure. with this, uh, with control fatigue training, I'll show you how. I'll I'll tell you a little bit about how I do it. So what I do is I go to the gym and I get on an elliptical machine. I do about 20 minutes interval training, right? So I hit it really hard for 20 minutes. And then I'm in a fatigue state after that. What kind of so, interval do you do on elliptic? Sorry, what's that? 
what kind of interval do you do on the? Uh, I put it on the hill program, and so every time, every time it, it, every time it's in between the hill, I go a little bit moderate. Once it hits the hill, I go all out for as long I, as it lasts. Right? Okay. So all I don't right. know exactly. So it's probably about a minute all out. Yeah, it's probably a minute all out, and then a minute moderate, minute all out for twenty minutes. So wow. it's pretty fatiguing, and I've been doing this for a while now, so I'm pretty good at it. But it, you're still fatigued afterwards. Now I'm trying to make myself fatigued too. I'm not just fatigued as a side effect because I want to go into the weight training in that fatigue state. And people are like, why would you want to do that? I mean, number one, it develops mental toughness training. You learn a lot about yourself. Yes. You're going to go lift really heavy weights in a fatigue state. Can you do that? And when you can, you're like, wow, I can apply this strength in a fatigue state. So that's very invigorating and that's very motivating. But what, what I didn't expect is the fact that I actually feel stronger in that fatigue state than I would be if I'm fresh. So when I deadlifted 550 pounds for three reps, that was in a fatigue state. Yeah. And I think it was actually easier in that fatigue state than it would have been if I just went in the gym and went through my warm up sets without being fatigued. So I think a lot of times people are going, be fresh all the time, make sure that you're not tired. You got to make sure your sleep is good, your pre-workout's good, then you do this. So everything has to be perfect, right? But the problem with that is, is that when you have to apply that strength in a real world situation, it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to have time to put all these things in place. Like, oh, hold on a second, let me get my pre-workout in, or hold on a second, let me get warmed up. You're going to have to be able to act in a very strong manner with yes. in, in, in most likely a situation that is far from ideal. So what I love about your, and also it's very convenient because before I used to separate cardio and weight training, I would do elliptical on one day, then I would do weight training the next day. So now I do it all on the same day, generally four to five times a week. So 20 minutes, all out interval training and then heavy weight training. And I, and I do full body weight training at every workout. I don't split up muscle groups or anything like that. So what's happened is, is that I reduced body fat and I've gotten way stronger. I'm way stronger at a lighter body weight than I was last year. And I'm also in way better fitness because I told you when we talked a while back that I had, I had a horrible flu, which turned into pneumonia last year. And it was very COVID like, I mean, it took months until I felt normal afterwards, which is what we're hearing about people recovering from COVID. And what I realized then is my respiratory system was so destroyed by that that I made it a priority to be have exceptional cardiovascular health. So I made that a priority. I put the heavy weight training on the back burner. I still did it to maintain, but my focus was, I wanna be able to sprint all day long. I wanna be able to do elliptical training all day long. I just wanna have massive amounts of, of respiratory energy. And that was definitely a really good move because I've never been healthier as a result of that. My blood sugar is really good. My blood pressure is great. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, I'm leaner and all that, which is never really a focus. I'm a, I'm a performance guy. I don't care about building muscle or being 5% body fat. You know, I want to be strong and fit and feel good, but, 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 but combining. So, so I'm going into your controlled fatigue training system with good respiratory, re respiratory fitness, as well as cardiovascular fitness. And now I'm combining it with strength training and it's actually improving both, which I found really interesting. So my question to you is, why am I stronger in a fatigued state <laughs> than I would be if I'm fresh? Because your body now become increasingly resilient to stress. Right. Come on, guys. Come on. In fact, I did address it again on my last book. Right. You trigger a very one of the oldest system that people today don't trigger. It's called the stress response system. And that system exists in all species from bacteria to humans. Right. It actually not only allow you to improve your ability to resist stress, it increase your lifespan. It can more than double. It can triple your lifespan. This is a critical system. If I got to the details, I don't have time. We can talk about it some other time. Sure. It it produces certain kind of protein that preserve your body, heat shock protein. It's a right. It actually relate to the preservation of your youth, your sex hormone, your testosterone, the balance between your hormone. When you do it right, this system becoming stronger and stronger every day and every week. Now, the factor is that your weight training 
is short and intense. Right. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <just> by. <laughs> short and intense. You leave it to the end. It's almost like a happy end. Right. The control fatigue train, the cardiovascular challenge, is intense. It's hard. But your body is already re ready for that. And when you are moving now to the weight training, your mind and the critical system, your sex hormones, and I wouldn't say anabolic hormones, the sex hormones they give you, everything is now set up to strike. Right. And you do it on cold, have you do it like other people do, you might become strong, but very limited. You're not biologically fit. Right. And you're not biologically The whole training is not constructed. You are not to improve every time. In the best case, you sustain and then you just age and naturally slow down. With the control fatigue training, which is a biological fitness, basically, you become biologically fit and that grunt progress. So when you train your body for hardship, it pay you back. Not only by making you stronger. If you, you can see, I put the research, the fiber, the quality of your muscle improve. Right. They saw mitochondria, the energy organelle in your muscle, pound for pound, you produce more energy. Right. The ability to convert triglyceride, fat in the muscle to energy, becoming so much more efficient. Yeah. And you don't even hit the wall. Usually the fast might muscles, are glycogen dependent. They depend on carbohydrates. But because you're so efficient in fat burning, when you hit your glycogen and fat in the muscle, when you go for weight training, strength, yeah, you're in a supreme uh, uh, system. Yeah. Energizing your muscle. And you know what? You're going to see if you don't see it already on the reps over time whatever you can do one rep you're going to do two reps or three yeah. reps or I'm, already I'm already experiencing that absolutely and actually i experienced it before because i'm familiar with your controlled fatigue training of course i remember you telling me about it back in 2002 and i've used it here and there but not as consistently as i am right now but in the past, I used I, I still love sprinting, but I used to go do 10, 50, 100 yard dashes, and then I would come home and lift weights. And I was always stronger after the sprinting than I would be if I didn't do the sprinting before. Same thing, I'm fatigued, but I remember I would clean two heavy kettlebells and I would just take them overhead easily, military press, several extra reps. And it felt light, felt like two hot air balloons going up. So it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting sensation and it goes against all of the, the nonsense we see propagated in mainstream fitness, just like your system of under eating and overeating is still in, in, in opposition to, to a lot of what we see out there. Correct. But you know what? It's coming again to faith. Do you believe that God created you in a certain way that you can improve far and beyond the physical? Yeah. Because if you do, you've got to be humble enough to see how were, were we designed to live? Are we designed to live in comfort or are we designed to half a hardship? Right. And I have to say that what you said before is true. We are designed for hardship and for suffering. We don't give ourselves enough hardship during the day. We absolutely lose one of the biggest purpose. Yeah. And honestly, it should be on anything we do, not just training. You go to learn something, don't learn it on full stomach. It's a big mistake. <laughs> yeah, it's true. They show you the research, oh, but look at children. If you don't give them breakfast, they crash down. Because they were trained since they are young to be dependent right. on sugar. Right, exactly. Even your child, be smart. I'm not saying put your child on intermittent water fasting, but don't give him food that make him numb and dumb right. in a, from early in the morning. 
you know. Supper should be, or dinner should be the main meal for everybody. Right. You know what? Even my dogs are in one meal per day. Yeah, the mine are too. The, my, my, one of my dogs, the one that you just saw run by, that's Reina. She's a border collie mix. Super muscular dog. I mean, she's got these really muscular legs. She sprints and plays like crazy. She doesn't eat during, I mean, she, she'll, she'll, she'll eat fun. I mean, if I give her a sweet potato or something, she'll eat it. But she's not craving food during the day. In fact, when I make her dinner for her and give it to her, she won't eat it then because we haven't gone walking yet. And if she wants to go for a walk and play with her friends and exert energy, then she'll come home and eat it. And as you can imagine, she doesn't have a, she doesn't have any body fat on her whatsoever. You know, she's a big muscular. She's sixty pounds. She's a muscular, athletic dog. You know, uh, these dogs are basically talking about huskies. They are really built for hardship. Oh, yeah. Look at the life that yeah. they have. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, I have to apologize. I got some engagement, but I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. Give me more time. Yeah, you've given me so much time. I appreciate it. So uh, where, where can where, what's your website now, or where, where can people go to stay connected with you? Currently, I um, the way to reach me is through the social media. I can okay. send the link, you know. I'll put your Instagram link yeah. up there. Also, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start posting one to three minute clips from this conversation on Instagram and I'll just tag you in those so you see those. And I'm going to upload this episode the second I get off with you. So it'll, it'll be up shortly. It'll be live on uh, YouTube very soon. Are you going to put the whole length or are you going to make it like two episodes? Uh, I'm, going to put the, I'm going to put the whole length up. But what I may also do is just take a lot of these three to five minute segments and put those up too. So it gets into more specific topics. Nice. Well, are we on tape now? Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> I'll stop recording. Yeah. Okay.